Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the very first WFO show, the only show, show that covers the world of open wheel racing at the speed you want it, wide open. I am your host, AJ Job, sitting next to me, my co-host, Mr. Billy Rowley, a sprint car extraordinaire, the original creator of Midwest Micros, uh, and very outspoken. I know you're going to get to know him quite well before this is over. Uh, also next to me, one Tony Main, you might know him from Indiana Sprint Cars on MAV TV, a regular competitor at Gas City and other Indiana Sprint Car tracks. As well, in the studio audience, we have the owner of TJ Racing Lubricants, Mike Job, in the audience as well. But we are here. Billy, how's it going, man? We're, we're about to do something that we don't even know what's going to happen, are we? That's how we like to do. Yeah. We wing things. Well, before we start, I would just like to take a minute to let you in on what this show is all about, kind of give you a manifesto, a reasoning for why we are here doing this right now. For those of you that don't know, WFO is an acronym, and it stands for Wide Effing Open. It's a motto or a lifestyle that open wheel racers or racers in general like to live by. In our case, it just describes the way we are going to approach this show. I, I think most of you are familiar with Wind Tunnel and might remember how great it was in the early days. And, and none of you will need me to explain who Robin Miller is or how he talks about open wheel racing every single day of his life. The ability to tell it like it is, for better or worse, no matter who you are going to upset, is a valued asset and we want to be that asset for you. Racing is a great sport. We all know that. However, it's, it's not always peaches and cream. There are good things that go along with the sport, and there are bad things that go along with the sport, which we love so very much. And the one good thing I want to talk about first, the great community we have. There is no community in any sport better than auto racing. We support each other no matter what, and that's very rare in this day and age. Yet for some reason, we also let money control this sport. Yeah, I know money controls everything, but what happened to the days when drivers got to the top of the sport on driver talent alone? You know, some NASCAR fans actually have no idea that Ryan Newman left Stuart Haas Racing because he didn't have a sponsor. I actually had a guy tell me, why would they get rid of Newman? They should get rid of Danica. He always beats Danica. Well, we open wheel fans know how that works because we've learned the hard way. Yet these days of social media and popularity determining what gets airtime and what doesn't doesn't allow for controversial things to be talked about so people can learn the facts. Now all we get from our media is how healthy open wheel racing is and how much fun it is. A never ending loop of preaching to the choir bullcrap that does none of us any good. Problem is that sometimes I think we believe it. And I know I'm guilty at times. Is open wheel racing cooler than NASCAR, the one series we always benchmark from? Yeah, probably. But have you seen the coverage they get? It's, it's really amazing. I mean, you can't say anything bad about it. Those guys can't go to a port john without the camera catching it. That's the truth. So we wonder, how can open wheel racing get that? And I have this theory on popularity in America. Some people think that interest in a sport gets you coverage. But I think that coverage is the only way to get you interest. Look at Facebook. You know what stories are most popular in the world? That's the ones they put in the corner and they say that are trending. Now, are they actually trending, or does Facebook put them there, and then we click on them, and that's what makes them trend? That's the thing. We don't know. And you just got to remember, we all want open wheel racing to be popular, but popularity is not always a good thing. What happens if uh, open wheel racing becomes so popular that we can't drink beers with one of our favorite drivers after the race? Popularity comes at a price, and it's not always a good one. Long story short, you know, I, I had this manifesto. I wanted to get it right. First show. You know, but we're here to make open wheel racing the trend. We're going to cover all the important news and discuss the real issues in the sport. We're never going to feed you a line of BS, and you will always have a chance to get in on the discussion. This show is for open wheel racing, and this show is for you, and I hope you enjoy it. Now, with that said, let's get on with the show and give you the headlines of the day. Back home again in India. The new track record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
first up, of course, the IndyCar series. And something very interesting that we've seen recently, Panther Racing filing a civil suit against IndyCar, the series, and Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan Racing. And Billy, there's, there's a lot going on with this, okay? And what's funny about this whole deal is we're talking about a team owned by John Barnes, a guy who said, now we're just talking rumors here, who said to owe his previous three drivers money. But what he is saying and what's happening there is a civil tort filed in Indiana's Marion County against document and packaging brokers, the Indy Racing League, Ray Hall, Letterman, Lanigan, and John Metzler. Now, document and packaging are the guys that put this bid together for everybody. IndyCar said, or the, the United States government said, we will take bids from six different teams. Now, document and packaging puts that together the bids for all six teams with John Metzler's help. And the thing is, they are saying, John Barnes is saying, that they had an exclusive agreement to be the sole promoter of the National Guard in Indiana's fan zone, in the fan zone that travels with the series. Well, it sounds a little funny that they would have an exclusive agreement if they wouldn't have the actual sponsorship itself. But that's what they're saying. The IndyCar has broken that rule, that, that agreement that they had, and they're saying that that is a breach of contract and they should have this bid overturned. But the United States government said no. And you got to think here, Ray Hall Letterman won this thing because they put in a bid for $5 million less. Billy, is this sour grapes from John Barnes? Or what's going on here? What are we supposed to make of this? Well, yeah, it's sour grapes. He shouldn't. There really is no discussion. I think the biggest thing was if you look at, except for Hildebrand, who's has been his drivers? Vitor Mira, um, they've all been in the open wheel word, the foreigners that have come over, and it's, in my book, it's, I'm not the most patriotic man in all of the world, but it's very odd to have a Colombian or a uh, Spaniard or, or anybody other than an American representing the National Guard. Even it was awkward when the late, great Dan Weldon was driving for him that you have a, a Brit that is supporting the National Guard. It's that it's really interesting to look at it that way, and and just you know I know a little bit about business law, and it just does not seem like they have a leg to stand on in this. Now, if if John Barnes could prove that the people that put this bid together and IndyCar and Ray Hall Letterman shared information together to ensure that they could put in a lower bid that would be accepted by the National Guard, that's one thing. But that's not what's being alleged. He does not have this proof, and I think this is all going to go away really quickly. Even if that was, it would still be sour grapes in my book. Whatever happened to the days where you made your sponsorship proposals yourself, you shouldn't need insider information to get another car or another right. into the series. Well, and, 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 and all in all, there's a bunch of lawyers that are going to make a bunch of money off of this yep. because the guys can't get it figured out themselves. It's a little ridiculous, and I don't see where... John Barnes goes from here because you're suing the series. And I think, but then again, I think he knows that because without that $17 million he was asking for from the guard, there's probably not going to be a Panther car in the field this year. Which is unfortunate. I mean, they were one corner away from winning the Indianapolis 500 and think, imagine, this never would have happened. There you if, go. If, if Hildebrand would not have plugged it into the fence as hard as he did, <laughs> He never would have won. They, they never would have lost the sponsorship to begin with. The National Guard would want to be with a winning team. So therefore, even if they've won one race in the last X amount of years, they won the most important yeah, race in the world. That's the one to win. And the only thing that I remember when you say the National Guard, I don't think of Dale Jr. Nation or anything <laughs> like that. I think of J.R. Hildebrand plugging an Indy car off a turn four at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Yeah. That's what I think of. And doing it as a rookie, and I can remember sitting in the stands and oh. seeing the car sliding by and crossing <laughs> the line. And the as a driver, what he could possibly have going through his head. Yeah, well, I, I know exactly what he had going through well, his head. Yeah. I, I've been there. It's it's that's the thing. Now he still got a good finish, but that like, asked Scott Goodyear about finishing <laughs> less than first at Indianapolis. He passed the pace car though. Well. That's another story right there. We'll get into that later. Let's move on. Let's talk about the guys who are going to be joining the Indianapolis 500 field. We know Juan Pablo Montoya. I don't have to tell you that. You know that's happening, which is great. Watch out, jet drivers. <laughs> well, yeah. 
Uh, first up, Jacques Villeneuve, 1995 Indy Car Indianapolis 500 champion, will return this year with Schmidt Peterson Motorsports. Now, Indianapolis 505 mile race. Very true, and Formula One world champion. This is also true. So let's put this together, okay? We have a Formula One champion. We have multiple Indianapolis 500 champions. We have multiple cart uh, champions, multiple IndyCar champions. But there's also somebody else that's going to come to this party. How about the outlaw, Kurt Busch, who is going to drive for Andretti Autosport in their fifth entry? We are talking about the NASCAR champion coming over, running in an IndyCar series race for the first time. Billy, I'm just going to let you go on this one because I know you've got something to say. I'm a big fan of Kurt Busch. Not because of his antics off the racetrack, but because he's aggressive. And I think that that's going to be the one thing that's going to be nice about it. That is, if he can make the car last till the race. My concern is that Jimmy Spencer is going to show up somewhere and really get him way too fired up. And he's going to J.R. Hildebrand himself and really, really make a mess. Do I think he's going to have a problem qualifying? Absolutely not, because we all know there may not even be 33. Um, but do I think that he could run a top 10? Absolutely. He's got talent. He's got the right team. That's, That's I think, the key. That's he's, the key. He's not going to be in junk. He's not going to be in a, yeah, it's a one-off deal, but he has the engineers around him that will put him in the right place. And anybody that thinks that they're not going to go test or that... Uh, Rick Mears is not going to give them a few extra laps on uh, on rookie days and rookie orientations, things like that. He's going to get up to speed really, really yeah. quick. He, the biggest thing that I don't like about it is the fact that it does bring the NASCAR hoopla to, in my opinion, the world's greatest race. Well, the team-wise, he's, he's still on the fourth entry for Andretti. I, I don't see... He might have the possibility of running 500 miles, but the fourth car of any team, I, I, don't, I don't see having the possibility of making it 500 miles. That's very true. And, you know, both of you bring up a pretty good question. Is this a circus publicity stunt to get more interest in the 500? I mean, I mean the guy's saying all the right things. He's saying he talked over uh, dinner with Michael Andretti about it. He says it's a dream come true, going to the Indy 500 with a name like Andretti, I mean, how does it get better than that? The reason why I don't think it is a media hoopla is real, real simple. Last year, he stated numerous times that he wanted to. The man has tested champ cars before. He has ran indie-style stuff before. You wouldn't step into that realm if it wasn't something that you do. And the reason why I do respect Kurt Busch is that he is a racer's racer. That man, if, if he had the ability to hop into a sprint car at Kokomo he'd be in trouble, but by God, he can do it. <laughs> he, that he's, he's a racer's racer. Give him a turtle, and he'd probably go race it. Well, I, I think you're probably right. I, I think, it, you know, obviously you can't ignore the fact that this is going to bring a lot of attention to the IndyCar series and the Indianapolis 500. Let me just put this out there. Do not expect this to be the last NASCAR driver to say that he's going to do the double, okay? There will be, I'm guaranteeing you, there will be another announcement Penske will pull out a car. I, I, I'm telling you right now, Penske will pull out a car. You talk about Kurt Busch being there last year. There was a guy named Brad Keselowski who was also there sitting on the pit box. And don't forget about Mr. Allmendinger either. I'm sure he wants another shot to lead some more laps at Indianapolis. But moving on, you know, one good thing we want to say about Kurt Busch, he is an advocate for, and representative for the Armed Forces Foundation. He's dedicating his Memorial Day mission, the whole 1,100 miles to them, the people who inspire him each day. Fans can show their support for this by texting AFF to 50555. Pledge $10 to the cause. I mean, you know, it's hard to go wrong with that. But let's go ahead and move on, and let's talk about what's going on in the world of Formula One. <laughs> Well, 
We know there's a lot of changes that happened with Formula One this year. Uh, how about a big change from V8s to V6s, turbocharged engines? And we know anytime there's any kind of rules changes to Formula One, they're going to push them as far as they can, normally over the edge. And we are seeing that in preseason testing. Reliability has not been there. But they are getting better. The teams are starting to look for speed. We're only uh, another week away from Australia, the first Grand Prix. But let's talk about the problems that we're seeing. And we'll start with the top team on the grid, the defending four-time world champions, Red Bull. How about exhaust packaging problems, overheating, engine failure, front suspension problems? They've had more problems than any other Formula One team on the grid. Mercedes, who has the best speed right now, is doing the best with their engines in all their different cars, has still had engines failed and gearbox problems. Ferrari, probably the team that's the least problem so far. Oil leaks, telemetry problems, little things like that. But then you got Lotus, Force India, Toro Rosso. They're all having problems as well. But, Billy, the first thing we got to talk about, Sebastian Vettel does not have a car that he is comfortable with going into Australia. Is this a chance for the other teams to jump on that? Or week three, are we going to see him return to form and Formula One is going to be completely boring for the rest of the season? It's been completely boring the last few years. <laughs> it's almost like he does this stuff on purpose because he is a bored individual. <laughs> Me and you will argue this. He is the best driver on that grid. Ah, your ah, your little Spaniard boy ah, is going to have a is has been having a very very big problem because now he doesn't have a teammate that's going to pull over and let him win races. Well. So with that being said. I don't think that there's going to be too much of an issue. I just think it's a that this is one of those things that Formula One does to create parity. They did it a few years ago um, with that double diffuser nonsense that basically gave Jensen Button a world title. Okay. Um, Rubens Barrichello was at the end of his career, and he was just as fast as him. Jensen Button is a, gr is a, is a good driver. He's a great driver. But what has he done in the McLaren? Well, when when no 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 sir <laughs> Wait, when Lewis about... when Lewis Hamilton was still there Lewis Hamilton had more pace every single show I... than than what Jensen did but it, it, in Formula One it's such a dominating car presence but there's one thing that Red Bull has in their pocket that nobody else in the world has and that is Adrian Newey well, Adrian Newey I am guaranteeing you is sitting in front of a computer near a wind tunnel absolutely losing his mind because his car is slow. And even if it's third, fourth, fifth quick, that's not good enough for him. And anybody that gets beat by a Williams, you better be sitting in front of a wind tunnel. Well, yeah, and I'm sure I'm not going to argue with you uh, about Mr. Newey take going to work because that read this, okay, Felipe Massa, the guy who got kicked out of Ferrari for not doing any good, has the fastest testing time uh, in the preseason testing in the Williams with the Mercedes power plant. So that's the thing that we're looking at, reliability problems going in to the first race. Uh, there's some t there's some people out there that think that all you got to do is finish the race and you'll be in the points. Like Caterham is hoping for that, but I'm not going to quite go so far yet. Now, another thing that we saw in the Formula One offseason, things that are changing, how about this rule, okay? For the finale in Abu Dhabi, they are going to award double points, okay? So where you normally get 25 points for a win, in the final race you're going to get 50 points for a win in the hopes to spice up the championship chase going in. What kind of a joke is this? This is go-kart nonsense. This is go-kart and quarter midget nonsense where yeah, you let, you got a 20 race schedule but we're going to throw out your worst three and give everybody a participation ribbon. I can think of two series that haven't done stupid gimmicks with their point system in the last, well, ever, that <laughs> still have a tight points race. IndyCar and USAC Dirt Sprint Cars. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand We this. could say USAC National Midgets and Silver Crown Series, but there's only, what, three drivers that run the full series If anyway. we get you on USAC Midgets, this show will go forever. So well, we're going to stop right there. But Adrian Newey's come out. He said he doesn't like it. Jean Tott says, well, I, I don't see any problem with it. 
it's going to happen. I see a huge problem with it. There is a massive problem with it. If, if that's the case, you could basically, if you have one failure, all, you could literally lead every lap all year, maybe fall off the podium once or twice, maybe run second or third, win a bunch of races, be the head of the class, and your motor blows up in yeah. the final race and you lose the world championship, you've seen Vettel get upset or <laughs> Fernando get upset. Imagine the Donald Duck fit that they are going to throw if they lose a world championship. Or And you also got to think of these implications. All the, all the money that comes into a Formula 1 team is points. That's all it is. If you don't finish in the points, exactly. you make zero dollars. Exactly. So you take a, a team that's in the back, the catering, the catering, the whatever the Virgin Mobile car is anymore. You take those teams, the the Lotus. Those guys, if they run, if they get any points at all, they're thrilled. Yeah. But you take a guy. Uh, I remember a few years ago, Adrian Sutil at, at Monaco. He almost won the Monaco <laughs> Monaco Grand Prix in a junk Force India car. Kimi Raikkonen crashed him, but he almost won that race. What happens if it? Well, it's not going to rain in Abu Dhabi. But what happens if there's like a dust storm or something, <laughs> and there's no grip on the racetrack, and a Caterham is the fastest thing out there and completely screws up? Sebastian Vettel's chance for a fifth world title, there's going to be a very big problem. It's going to be crazy. And let me just put it this way, the final note on this. You will score more points for winning the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix than you will for winning the Monaco Grand Prix or at Monza. You could win both of those prestigious races. You'll score the same amount of points for winning at Abu Dhabi. Well, and, Unless, it's, a, and I mean, it's, a, it's a joke just like the NASCAR deal is. You can try to fabricate a story all you want to, but if you dominate 20-something races out of the year and then reset the points, no. Yeah. Those guys have bust their butts all year to just win everything, and when you take that away and start over, it, it, this is doing the exact same thing. Well, let's talk about a race that's not going to happen uh, we had a little bit of a scare in IndyCar Town earlier this week as the Long Beach City Council pondered to changing to a Formula One race in 2016. Uh, as it happens, they met on Tuesday, decided not to do this, but for a little while we thought that we could possibly see Formula One back at Long Beach. Uh, Billy, you know, Formula One, comparing Formula One races to IndyCar races monetarily, the fees that you have to pay to put towards a Formula One race, and then hope that you get the economic impact that you want. Is it even worth switching from IndyCar to Formula One? I think it could be in the right situation, but the problem is, is the state of California is broke. Well, the city of Long Beach is broke. The IndyCar race there has been in jeopardy a few different times. It, it's Long Beach has lost its luster. Now, would I love to see Formula One back there again? Absolutely. The problem with the the, the problem with the whole thing is is real real simple. The economics don't make sense. Texas had to build a what few billion dollar facility in order to get F1 there and keep everybody happy. The city of Long Beach would have to still repave things. Mm -hmm. One Formula One car hits a manhole cover and the front end <laughs> flies off of one. Then what are you going to do? Then you've got an Indianapolis situation where you got six cards and the guy driving the Minardi is thrilled because he was on the podium. Yeah, well, several million dollars it would take to upgrade. It's not going to happen. We don't have to worry about it anymore. But it was an interesting story for the midweek. So that's enough of Formula One. Let's go to the dirt with the World of Outlaws Sprint Car Series. You wanted the best. You got it. Boy, if that don't make you feel like you're at Eldora right there, I don't know what does. It gets the goosebumps going. The first week of the World of Outlaws STP Sprint Car Series this week, held down in Felucia, Florida, Brad Sweet, Donnie Schatz, and Steve Kinzer taking wins at Volusia to start the season. Uh, we talk about the final season, the final full season for Steve Kinzer. Says he's not going to retire, 
but it's the salute to the king. How nice is it to see him take home a victory in the first week of the season, get that monkey off his back? Get it out of the way before he gets tired. I think that's the big, I think that's the big key. I'm a huge Steve Kinzer fan, and I have been for a long, long time. But the man is old. Now, granted, that man being as old as he is and chain smokes <laughs> as many cigarettes as he does is still probably one of the top three baddest men on the planet in a sprint car, whether it has a wing on it or not. Very impressive. So you don't, you'd don't, never bet against him, but at the same time, Donnie Schatz is really, really, really fast. Um, well, the 20, 21 wins he had last year? Yeah, and lost the championship. It wasn't even sprint car driver of the year. Okay, I know, Darren Pittman, you know Darren Pittman is my boy, okay? I'm very happy to <laughs> see used, Darren Pittman You guys there. used to be teammates. Well, there you go. Uh, but... <laughs> I, I like Darren Pittman. I'm glad that he won the championship last year. That was a guy who was very upset at Volusia because he got beat by Kinzer in the final race, was very upset, felt like he had a car to win, and uh, gave it away. So he is chomping at the bit to get back to action. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, 10 p.m., I believe, is when they're going to start covering that on Dirt Vision. So if you're into some World of Outlaw Sprint Car Racing tonight, check that out. Paul McMahon and Darren Pittman tied for the points lead. Brad Sweet in third. There's a guy I would love to see win an outlaw title. Paul's to the wall, Paul McMahon. The man can qualify and the man can race. The man can qualify and ra race in California. Wait. Now he's just got to get it on the dry, slick stuff that's out here in the Midwest. Well, you got that new qualifying rules as well, and a lot of people are saying that he's got the right attitude, the right approach to qualifying. It's putting him in good positions, working out well so far. But that's enough about the wing stuff. Let's take those wings off and talk a lot about a little bit of non-wing USAC sprint car action. First week of USAC Sprint Car Action held in Ocala, Florida. One night rained out, but Brady Bacon and Flying Brian Clawson take home victories in, well, it, it wasn't snowy and cold down there, but it was up here. Tony Main, obviously they're lucky that you didn't make the trek down to Florida, right? Am, am I right? Obviously, that, the new spike would have been hooked up and working well <laughs> had it been put together. Well, the first night uh, when Brady Bacon won, Clawson had a flat ref, left rear tire, uh, right rear tire, sorry, uh, and came back through the field. I think he ended up seventh, uh, right. so saved Brady Bacon's bacon that night, but uh, came back and won on the final night. Uh, Brian Clawson, is there any question in your mind that this Tony Stewart team is not going to take another, what, third consecutive USAC Sprint Car Championship? Any question in your mind? Yeah, I have lots of it. It's called Dave Darling. Oh. I like what I see there. Um, but, Tony, you're a huge fan of Brady Bacon, though, aren't you? We, we've had our run-ins, but he is now he is now a local <laughs> board to me and in Randolph County, so I, I don't have a whole lot of issues with him. There you well, go. hey, that just gives me hope that people can make up then. But I'm with him. I, I like I, – last year, I, don't get me wrong, I, I really do like Brian Kloss, and I respect him. I, I love what he's done. Um but I wanted to really see last year that Phillips car take home a national championship. When you think about that, my dad, when he had sprint cars, they won a few titles with a guy out of Mich or out of out of Elkhart, and uh, with a wing on it out of a out of a garage with a with a 36 foot trailer, one car, one motor. And you know the Phillips team is doing it the right way. They're 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 doing it the right way. They're it's it's a it's a one car team, not necessarily what you think about when you think of a USAC national. I think of the Dutcher team that shows up with a toter home in three or four cars, yeah. the Gulicks of the past, and and all these bigger teams. But I don't I, I would I don't think Clawson's out to lunch by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. That's that's a team you're never going to bet against. Right. Bob East has been really good on the on the wrenches, and I was shocked last year to see that's not a Maxim. That's a that's an actual beast. Dirt car, which how long has it been since I believe heard that? Jeff Gordon drove the last <laughs> one that actually won races, but Damian Gardner drove him for a little bit. Okay, okay. Um, but I just I don't see Darlin's the real one. I see. I think uh, Chase Stockin's going to be one that's really going to be effective, and 
disrupting plans because he's been really, really fast. And then Stanbro's the other scary one to me. Once they get back to Indiana and Stanbro can hustle around Bloomington and Putnamville, the places that he knows real, real well, that's also a dangerous combination. But I think the new tire is going to affect more people than what they think. And, and Dutcher and Kevin Thomas back together again. And what, they won six six shows last year in right. USAC? Six or seven, yeah. yeah. yeah well, that would be another tough, tough I'm, team. I'm really amazed at the cars. The car counts are going up, okay? The teams are getting tougher. Uh, and it's going to be interesting. I still, I'm you, to get me to bet against Brian Clawson. I'm sorry. I just, I'm just not going to do it. But we will see how it happens. Uh, they get back into action April 5th at the Lawrenceburg Speedway. So that's coming up pretty soon. Hopefully, we get dethawed up here in Indiana so we can actually enjoy that. Um, that's it for headlines. We 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 talked our our butts off right there. But let's move on and give you the question of the day. The question we want in your minds what we're going to discuss in the next segment and uh, all of you viewers watching on YouTube feel free to comment get involved in the discussion as we go forward here but today's WFO discussion the question of the day does the Grand Prix of Indianapolis in the month of May take away from the prestige of the Indianapolis 500 we're going to dive into that all of the stuff that's coming in to this month of May all of the changes some people were upset that we're going to be running on a road course couple weeks before we run the greatest spectacle in racing. So we're going to dive in to that after this break. So please stick with us. We'll be back in just a few minutes talking about that and all the other major talking points in open wheel racing. You are listening to the WFO Show. We will be right back. <laughs>
To win in racing, you need every advantage you can get. From the tires to the engine, if you can make your car better, you do it, even if it's expensive. But what if I told you that you can go faster just by changing your oil and save money in the process? Well, that's exactly what TJ Racing Lubricants can offer your team. TJ Racing Lubricants gives your engine five to seven more horsepower than the brand name competitors while protecting your most expensive parts and lengthening time between rebuilds. Look for TJ Racing Lubricants at the track or go to tjracingoil.com to see how TJ can give you the edge that you need to cross the finish line first. Welcome back to the WFO Show. AJ, Billy, Tony back with you once again to talk open wheel racing and with all the excitement of the events themselves, but none of the BS. Remember, if you're watching live via YouTube, you can get involved in the discussion at any time by commenting in the show feed or even by sending us an email at WFOshow at live.com. We can also be found on Facebook, facebook.com WFO Show forward slash WFO show and twitter.com forward slash WFO show like us follow us and join in on the fun guys what we're going to be talking about there's a brand new month of May coming very soon okay for the first time we're going to have two IndyCar races at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway in the month of May the Grand Prix of Indianapolis is coming. We're going to run the road course with Indy cars. We're going to switch over to the Oval, do a qualifying weekend, and then we're going to run the greatest spectacle in racing. There's plenty of people upset about this, and there's plenty of people that feel like there should only be one race ran at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway every year. What do we think about this? What do we expect? Is this new month of May going to take away from the prestige of our most famous event? AJ, do you remember, I believe it was 95, maybe 96, on TV when Mary Holman, bless her heart, was standing there and they were like, Mary, start the race. <laughs> Mary Holman, at this point in her life, would still not start this race. Okay. I am so against this, it's not even funny. I was against NASCAR in 94 and I was only 10 years old. I was against... I was against Formula One, but I respected it because it was at least the road course. Okay. I would be okay even if they did do a race not in the month of May. If they wanted to do one in conjunction with the Trans Am series, or if they had um, you know, the Superbike or MotoGP or whatever it was, I would even be okay with that, but not during the month of May. The month of May is a sacred, sacred month to myself, and I know also to Tony here. You've only got really, in my opinion, three things that matter during the month of May. You have, at least in racing, you have the Indianapolis 500, mm -hmm. you have the Little 500, okay. and you have the Hoosier 100. I don't even count the night before the 500 anymore right. because it really doesn't even exist. Didn't even run it last year. Did no. It? no. But I guess I understand the logistics side of it, but as a, as a purist, I don't like it. But then again, if I had it my way, they wouldn't have roll cages, and the motor would be in front of the driver as well. Well, another thing we got to look at, and Tony, I know you're going to speak on this. There's we don't run practice for the entire month of May anymore. So there's two weeks in there that are completely unused. You can save money, save tires for the teams, things like that, by going ahead and having another event, making it a making those teams able to make money without using all of that track time. I mean. What do we think? I mean, there's there's a way. This is a way to ma put more money in the team's pockets and give the fans more action as well. Yeah, no purist is gonna like it. It's it's horrible, and and nobody is more educated on the history of Indianapolis than I think I could be at times. But it's it's a way for the teams to make money. It makes it a month of May again. There's gonna be something going on all the time in May, which is awesome to finally get that back. But it, yeah, it, it makes it cheap. It, it, the, the Grand Prix of Indianapolis is going to be really, really hard to see a car turn right and go right onto the end. <laughs> but my question is: Is doesn't it, it take something away from the month of May? If if I let's be honest, I, I've 
I've retired from the from the shot at the Indianapolis 500. I'm a, <laughs> I suffer from Tony Stewart syndrome. I'm a little fat, but that and not enough talent. Okay. Okay. Just I, I, <laughs> we'll cover all bases here. But with that being said, granted, when you win a race at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, it has to be one of the greatest feelings in the world. But I think it's kind of like an Ed Carpenter thing. Ed Carpenter's technically won two races at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Right. That ain't cool with me because it's still not... It, it, yeah, it's Indy, but it was in the Infinity Pro or Infinity Lights or whatever they are now. Now Indy Lights. Right. But it takes away from if you did win. You know, it's. I guess it's kind of... I'm glad Tony Kanaan won the race last year because knowing his luck, he would have won this stupid race... And then crashed out of the Indy 500, and then he would have went, well, I still wanted Indy. Well, but it wasn't Indy. Right. Your face is... I don't feel like you truthfully wanted Indy until your face is stuck on a Borg Warner trophy somewhere. With that being said, well, I understand the logistics side of it. It's going to make people money. Hopefully it brings more people in. Some of the Euro snobs that only like think that real race cars go both directions... Maybe they'll understand now and start to come back, but I don't think that this does anything for the purest in the sport. A lot of the open wheel fans, the, the listeners of this show that are regulars to Kokomo on a Sunday night or Gas City on a Friday, I don't think that they're going to be the ones that really embrace the true indie car fans do. Well, and, you know, I, in this discussion, I kind of want to go back all the way to 1994. The people who are upset, okay, they were upset in 1994. Well, let's go back to that time. We're talking about a time when open-wheel racing was the pinnacle, okay? The Indianapolis 500 was the pinnacle. The, you know, Indy Series at that time was the pinnacle of the sport. And here they were bringing stock cars in. Some people thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. Plenty of people thought, oh, we're going to let the hillbillies in and they're going to laugh and, and point and cheer when the cars hit the wall, and then everybody's going to go home, and we're all going to feel dirty, okay? And that's the truth. Well, now we live in a different age, okay? NASCAR controls this whole deal. Not only do they control racing as a sport, they also have the Indianapolis Motor Speedway building them an apron. We are changing the Indianapolis Motor Speedway so that NASCAR can put on a better show. Okay, I realize, 80s. Early 90s, we had an apron at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. That's fine, okay? They made for some great racing. I, I can think of Rick Mears and Michael Andretti in 1991 putting on one heck of a show. Man, Rick Mears schooled the Andretti. Well, man, didn't he? let's not get into that. But, okay, they're not going to let the Indy cars run on this apron. They have stated that this apron will be used for the NASCAR race only to try and make it a better race, okay? Because it's not a cookie cutter track. Well, <laughs> I well, but my my question is, is is I don't necessarily disagree with it that that they shouldn't. I think I would personally like to see how fast an Indy car could go around there if they could use the apron again. They were busting off what two twenty five to thirty laps in ninety three, ninety four, ninety five with an apron. Now, but those were the death trap Reynards well, that they had yeah. as well. But when you take a car car that they have today, that might be a, a, it almost might make the race worse, because it might make everybody that much faster, because they can trim the cars out more, they can sweep the corners longer, or wider, I think it would benefit a guy like Robbie Gordon that ran high there all the time, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing, I just don't like the fact that, they're, that the Indianapolis Motor Speedway is changing their racetrack to suit... NASCAR, which we can all go and say NASCAR is the big honcho, but let's just call it what it is. 90% of their races are absolutely boring. The Indy race there has been terrible. Um, I can't think of a quote-unquote good one. I can come up with multiple Indy 500s off the top of my head. Well, just, just recently, I mean, the fans have spoken. You didn't get, I mean, they didn't have 100,000 people there at the Brickyard last year, and the Indy 500 stands were packed. Now, I know that they're repairing some of the grandstands, so they didn't have all the seats, but that's the thing. We got some differing opinions on YouTube as well. Blaine Culp 
uh, local micro sprint driver. He says, uh, you know, maybe they need more money and need people to come watch at the greatest golf cart path in the country. So, you know. Blaine, 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 Blaine. Now, Kevin Springsteen, he says it's a little different. He's fine with them running on the road course. He thinks it'll be great. Thinking back to Jim Clark, you know, I mean, we're, we're attracting Formula One champions. We're attracting NASCAR champions and, and everything back to the Indianapolis 500. It seems like it's gaining steam heading in the right direction, but, I mean, is this is this something that could derail that? If we have more fans than NASCAR is getting at Indianapolis, if, you know, it seems like the momentum is there, we're having great races, if we make all of these changes to try and suit, you know, the casual fan or whatever you want to call it, does that take away from that great honored tradition that we're seeing coming up on the 100th race? Does no. it take away? No. It, it, you cannot take away from the greatest spectacle in racing. They, it, 1911, they ran race cars around this joint. 1909, they guys on bikes <laughs> ran through gravel. <laughs> I mean, and before that, the first one, a balloon race. You, so, you can't. You, the town is named Speedway, okay? There is nothing you can do to take away from the aura of that place. I remember the first time I saw it, I'm man enough to admit it, I shed a tear or two. Yeah. Because that place is special. When you drive through the tunnel and you pull up and you see the museum and you go inside and you see the history that's there, and even when you take the rinky-dink bus ride around there, you can almost feel... Roger Ward, you can feel A.J. Foyt, you can feel everybody that's always been there. You can feel Mike Job getting buzzed on the pit wall <laughs> by Tom Bigelow. Snake can, pit stuff. Snake you know? pit stuff. You can feel all that where I've never been to Daytona, but in my opinion, I don't think it's as special. And I don't know if this race is going to take away from it. I don't think it's going to add anything at all. I think it... But... Now, would it be cool to see a guy like, I don't know, or Ryan Hunter Ray do the double and win both? Yeah, that might be pretty yeah. neat to see. Yeah, maybe you put some money on but the But then line. again, does he go, oh, that's cool. Yeah. You know, I won Indy well, twice in the same year. That's kind of, that takes away the aura. You get one chance to win Indy all year. And some guys only get one. I mean, so some guys great only drivers get, get zero. This is Dave Darlin being one of them. <laughs> But going to the short track stuff, and the readers of Speed Sport will know that there's been a couple of snippets in there from some of the editors about the possibility of Indianapolis looking at adding, along with what road course changes they make, somewhere situating a 3 8 mile fairly flat track with the possibility, even late this fall, having the option of possibly running either midgets or wing sprint cars down there. Now, Billy... You set a pavement sprint car, pavement-ish sprint car. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Ish and the ish is very, very delicate there. But wouldn't how neat would that be to be able to roll into the track with guys that you know, and be pulling a 410 wing car to run there? Now, now that totally changes your cheapening Indianapolis idea because no 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 that's different because that's, that's realistic for me to race there now. <laughs> okay. I'm one of these both sides. Okay. I, I'm. I'm one of these glasses, either full or empty, depending on how it looks and how it benefits me. Now, in the grand scheme of things, this also goes against some of your morals, Tony. Those things that you have to would have to put on the top of your car are called wings. But our you, payment car does have wings plugs on it. But that goes against the morality of many a Hoosier that yeah. thinks sprint cars don't have wings to them. But, now, I do think that that would be a very cool outlet to get... I personally think, if you want my humble opinion, to get the older generation back to Indianapolis that or those people that do go to Gas City on a Friday night or Kokomo on Sunday or wherever they go on Saturday, if you got to go see a Dave Steele, a Troy DeCare, a Jeff Bloom, a Brett Mann if he ever got back in a pavement car, a Tony Main, if you got to go see some of those guys that you watch each and every week at your local tracks race at the greatest race course in the world, I think that's pretty cool. I think that makes it a little bit special. Yeah, it is It is pretty neat, I think. Um, the thing is, you've got to be really careful on how far you go before you're basically setting up circus tents. 
I, I think that's now I, I'm all for that and you talk about trying to get that older generation back I, I gotta tell you I think this it's cold hard fact I think this IndyCar series in this day and age they don't care I think they want the younger generation they're going after the NASCAR people is that the right thing that's a completely different show I think we could we could do an entire discussion on it my personal opinion I'm fine with the Grand Prix of Indianapolis. I will be there. It's going to be interesting. It's a purpose-built road course, okay? And it's a beautiful road course, very wide. We could see excellent racing. At the end of the day, if we see a lot of passing on this road course, nobody's going to care, okay? And that's what that's what it's going to take. I'm, I'm fine with it. Let's see how it works and put some money in the team's pocket. Maybe it becomes a big event itself, uh, and it could be very interesting. But we do have to be careful, like you said, you're not going to take away from the prestige of the greatest spectacle in racing, but at the same time, we don't want to lose the momentum that we're gaining. But then again, I think I think this is a good idea. I think this could propel the entire month. We're not using that week anyway. Let's use it. If they did it, if they do it the smart way, we went a few years ago, back when F1 was still there. We went on a practice day. We had the sunburns for a good two or three weeks right. after to prove it. But I enjoy that day because of the way that a road course race, and if you've never been to a road course race before, generally speaking, unless you buy a grandstand ticket, you buy a general admission ticket, which is good for virtually anywhere on the grounds right. or the property. The great thing is if you want to watch a vantage point from a grassy hill at the end of Holman Boulevard and watch them go into the hairpin, you can go grab your cooler of beer and your blanket and sit down with your wife and your kids and watch the race. If you choose to go to another hill at the other end of the racetrack, that's fine too. We moved around a lot that day, and I think from a fan standpoint, especially from a viewer that's used to watching, you know, AMA Supercross or one of the more quote unquote action sports that they're used to things happening each and every minute, the fact that somebody could actually get up during a race and walk to a different vantage point and see a different part of the racetrack may help bring some people back. The only thing I would like to see is that those people that do come for that race that are new stay for the Indianapolis 500 and maybe understand more about what the purists like myself, Tony, and you think about it. Well, keep them around. It's an interesting thing, and, and you know, it's a pro tip, like you're saying, don't buy a okay, buy a grandstand ticket, but get out there for the practice days and qualifying days. Get in the infield. Uh, get on that golf cart track that Mr. Blaine Culp is talking about because that is very cool because any 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 open wheel car on a road course is on the edge all the time. You like you know you got plenty of people who only go to dirt races because they like to see cars sliding that's still sliding every single lap. But that's going to be it for our WFO discussion this week. We're going to take our final break, and when we get back, we're going to go over your thoughts and the big races you have to look forward to this weekend. You are listening to the WFO Show. Please stay tuned.
You and your car make a great team. You've known it since the first time you strapped in, but your inability to win, also known as checkered flag dysfunction or CFD, could be a question of oil flow. TJ Racing Lubricants helps keep you ready to win when the moment is right. TJ gives you confidence and puts your mind at ease so you can focus on what's important. Tell your engine builder about your CFD and ask him if he thinks your heart is healthy enough for TJ. Do not use TJ Racing Lubricants if you are satisfied with running in the back. Do not drink alcohol in excess with TJ, at least until the race is completed. Side effects include lower lap times, more time between rebuilds, increased heart rate, and skid marks in your fire suit. To avoid long-term injury, seek immediate medical help for a victory celebration lasting more than four hours. If you experience any difficulty breathing or swallowing while using TJ Racing Lubricants, this is normal. You're going faster. Maybe it's time you talk to your engine builder about TJ Racing Lubricants. We are back with the WFO show. You you gotta love that commercial. I you know that's a little special treat we had for you there. Uh, definitely check out TJRacingOil.com uh, for all of your lubrication needs. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube and participating in the discussion, we thank you for getting involved, and we want to let everyone know that this show will also be available on iTunes and Stitcher Radio to listen to at your leisure on mobile devices. We'll go into the approval process on that this week. When it's out, we'll let you know. So get on our, our social media, Facebook and Twitter. You'll, you will know when you can download those. And when we get that, iTunes listeners, please be sure to subscribe to the podcast to have the show automatically download to your computer each week and give us ratings and reviews to help the show grow and improve every episode. We want your feedback. We want to know what you want. Uh, and we'll try and make this show exactly what you want. YouTube friends, the same thing. Subscribe, you'll get every show, and we can have this kind of fun uh, nearly every week. This is the part of the show where anybody that listens not live, if you want to get in the discussion, we'll take emails and messages, and we will put it in from last week. Obviously, since this is episode number one, there is no last week, nothing to go over. YouTube was kind of, uh, we had a couple of comments, thank you guys, not very many, so we don't have anything to go over. So we're going to go straight in to the racing outlook for this week. So uh, it's still early in the, in the year, we're not to the racing season. IndyCar starts up March 30th in St. Petersburg. Formula One, March 15th in Australia. We're going to have a Formula One season preview next week. That will be the show next week, so we'll get you set for Australia. USAC's not back in action until April 5th at Lawrenceburg Speedway, but the race of the week, default race of the week, because nothing else is going on, but a good race nonetheless. The World of Outlaws will be in Las Vegas at the dirt track for the Outlaw Showdown tonight, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. Live on Dirt Vision starts at 10 o'clock Eastern Time, so after we get done here, get you some food, whatever you need, get back on the couch, turn on the Dirt Vision, and watch the World of Outlaws. I don't think you'll be disappointed. going to see if Darren Pittman can make up for his mistake from Volusia and bring home the checkered flag. Well, you know, that's it, guys. Uh, I, I, I just want to say thank you, Billy, for being here, Tony. Mike Job, we appreciate it. I'm glad everybody had fun. I, I think I think this is something we should do as much as we can. We had a little fun. I'm sure people are going to enjoy this. I mean, what more do you say? This is open wheel racing at its best, raw, uncut, and uh, and you know we're here to try and make this thing grow, right? I'm just glad I made it through a whole episode, and I don't think I cussed once. <laughs> I don't think you're going to have to use the bleeper. Well, One last thing for me, March 29th um, at Brownstown Speedway. Um, the Jesse Hockett No Way Out 40. That's another big one that to to keep on your calendar, um, which we've all found or which we've found out that uh, there may or may not be a special a surprise appearance from one driver that may be coming out of retirement. Not me. Don't worry. Okay, so, okay. so Dave Darwin and everybody else can you know rest easily. <laughs> But, um, now, Jack Slash, are they covering this? Yes, this that's be going to be the on Dirty 30? the Dirty 30 on Mav TV. So okay. if you don't have Mav TV, you ought to um, get it. You yes, ought to absolutely. get it. And, and Tony Maine saying that, 
That's on that channel's on cable. You will this get, man still you will uses a flip this, phone. Yeah. <laughs> he 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 it took him a while to figure out you didn't put a DVD in a VCR. Yep. I mean, the, it's so if Tony Main backs ca cable television uh, and Map TV is great in general for for yep, open wheel absolutely. short track racing. I mean, yep. if you're let's just call it what it is. If you're a sprint car fan, you're a sprint car fan. You yeah, do. we've got our friends that won't walk across the street to a wing sprint car race, but if it's on television, they're going to tune in because they're going to support sprint car racing. And general. you will get to see this guy on that show, on that entire network this year. He'll be there. I want to tell you something. If you've never seen him race, I've tried to pass this guy. Not easy, I'm telling you. I'm just going to put that out there. But He also one time tried to pass Bob McCombs at Peru. <laughs> And uh, if you want to see that, YouTube that. That's also a very you, good. You keep uh, you keep bringing up things we can do a whole show on. I, I, that was just too, to, that was just too funny. Yeah, but that's the checkered flag for this show. We'll be back next week with all the news you care about from the world of racing and a preview of the Formula One season. Until then, feel free to get involved with in the discussion with us online. We are always ready to bench race with you. For Billy Rowley, Tony Main, Mike Job. This is AJ Job saying enjoy your racing at a comfortable speed this week so you can come back here and talk about it with us, WFO. Catch you next time.